champion in the house? Is there a champion in the house this morning? Do I see any champions here? I feel championship uh, seated in those pews. I, I feel it. Uh, I think there's a lot of hard work that's been going on, but I just want to ask the question. Is there a champion in the house? Now, three questions only human beings ask. No other living organism, no cow, no monkey, no dolphin uh, asks. The, they don't even ask one of these questions. The question number one is origins. Where do I come from? Question number two, where am I going? What is my destiny? And question number three we're going to try to address this morning is, why am I here? You never heard a chicken say, bah, bah, why am I here? Why am I here? Or a cow, why am I here? No. They, 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 it's, out of their, it's just out of their league. Okay, now if you go to evolution, they'll teach you that your chemicals and energy and um, time and chance, and you just happen to pop out by a um, cosmic accident. And so they, they give you significance by telling you that you don't have it. And um, you're just another kind of animal. Uh, you just... Uh, like a dog or an insect or a cow, you know, you live here, you're a wet spot, and, and you're gone, and then now into the next generation. And so you really your significance is a big, fat, round zero if you ask evolution. If you'll forgive me for just a moment, your humble servant, that's me. Um, I do have a degree in physics and mathematics. I would say that I'm reasonably intelligent. Some people don't agree, but uh, <laughs> that's the way it is. But <clears throat> And so I, I study evolution. I study it because it's good to know what the enemy is teaching. And I have come to the conclusion that Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, Porky Pig, and Bugs Bunny, and throwing Santa Claus, and evolution is about the same thing. Um, I mean, the scientific evidence is so overwhelming when you study the DNA and the DNA molecule and so on. It's, it's compelling scientific evidence that the information, who put that information in the DNA molecule? Information only comes from intelligence. What a mighty God we serve. Amen. Now we go over and we've opened the, the book that never changes. Science changes weekly. And uh, the, you go to the book and <clears throat> you have significance. You have worth. You have a destiny. Your life has a purpose. And I see some some heads with a little gray on it, and I would like to tell, speak to my more mature brothers and sisters, such as myself, okay. Uh, Moses didn't get started until he was 80 years old. So don't die until you're dead. <laughs> In the meantime, live, spit, kick, rock the boat, do something, get out of the boat. Just a suggestion. <laughs> yes, you have great potential. Everything you've done until now, all your good, the bad, the ugly, everything you've accomplished till this day is your achievement. But what God has put within you, the talent, the abilities, the creativity, the intelligence, the passion, the vision that you have not yet done, that's your potential. And your potential is greater than your achievement because it builds on your achievement. You say, well, all my achievements aren't that great. We'll talk about that in a moment. But your life does have significance. Yes, it does. If you're here and you're breathing, and you are, I observe, you're, you're here for a reason. There's a reason, and it's more than just being uh, going and getting an education, getting married, procreate, um, 
get a job, retire, and then die. Eternal significance is what God put within you. Not to grovel in the, the sticks and mud of the earth and growl for insects and worms or something. You were destined to fly, fly high, see further, rise higher with the wind of the Holy Spirit Haramandai carrying you along. That's what you're destined to do. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as of eagles. So I ask the question again. Is there a champion in the house this morning? Oh, I hear you. You can't be silent. You have to respond. Amen? Well, that's a good sign, but uh, I'll ask the question again later because uh, I want to touch your heart. God is looking for champions. Why? Because the world needs you. Wherever you look, our uh, esteemed officer with the handgun, Glock, no doubt, uh, on his side, knows this as well as, or more than any, wherever you go, there's pain, there's trouble, there's sorrow, there's hurt. You know that. And uh, you're the champion that will bring Christ to these situations. People are dying. Fathers are carrying their sons who have been shot. There's loneliness. Oh, Roy, loneliness? Yeah, just remember Robin Weed. Us all laugh. Deathly depression under them. She said, Children are starving even as we're here this morning. If, they, if, if, if we could send it to them all the table scraps from the Golden Corral, they would break it. Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq. Incredible, inhuman things being done to human beings. Does the world need champions? Yes. Does God need champions? Yes. Where are these champions? They're here this morning. It should touch my heart, a mother trying to comfort her weeping children full of fear because of things that she cannot prevent, the bombing, the slaughter. And so the world is on fire. God needs champions. God needs you. And here we have another flame fire burning within this church, and that's the fire of the Holy Spirit. Oh, when God baptizes you in the Holy Spirit, it's not for you to speak in tongues. Tongues is a tool, but the job is done. Ye shall receive power, and ye shall become witnesses. Witnessing doesn't only happen by talking. It happens by going. It happens by sacrifice. It happens by giving yourself. I surrender all. It happens by a process where God makes champions. A biblical example I love to use is David because I, I love Daniel and I love Joseph, but those men were too good for me. I need a man down to earth, an earthy guy like David. I uh, connect with a guy like David. I'm so glad God put him in the Bible because then I know there's hope for me. I'm uh, just a sinner saved by grace. By grace it started, by grace it is, and by grace it's going to finish. And uh, if you're going to follow God, you're going to meet enemies. If you want a bowl of cherries, do something else. But if you want significance, pay the price. And here, uh, this uh, enemy with a big mouth, you know, hurling words of fear and intimidation and uh, speaking out against the Lord and his people and uh, challenging, they had a champion. 
But there was a little boy who heard this, a young man. And uh, he didn't want to be a champion particularly. He just wanted to shut that guy up and put him down. And he did. You do that too. In order to become a champion, I've never met a champion who said, oh, I'm a champion. How did that happen? Wow. No. A champion is always intentional. You've got to want it. You've got to focus. Oh, uh, instead of telling people what they can't do and what they shouldn't do, just give them a dream, give them a focus, and they don't want to do that stuff. When you see the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, you don't want to go back there. You don't want to taste that kind of life again. Why? Because you used to eat cardboard burgers at McDonald's, but now you've tasted filet mignon, the finest of the wheat. You don't go back there. Yeah. To become a champion, you've got to want it. I, I was born and raised in New York City. I'm on 33rd Street and Coit Avenue. You know, so you you got to want it. Well, you need to have the passion, the desire, the deep commitment to want it. So let's go. Number one, you need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, not to know about him, but to know him. The Apostle Paul says, I want to know him, know him, like you know your wife or husband. Know them on an intimate level. You want to know him. Yes, nobody said it would be easy. It's just worth it. A thousand times over, it's worth it. Ask the Apostle Paul. I reckon none of these things can be anything for the prize of the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus, to know him in the fellowship of his sufferings, and then you get to the next step, and you see him in the power of his resurrection. Oh, yeah, that's where it's going. That's where you're destined to be, working in the power of his resurrection. Isaiah, this good man, religious man, but one day he saw the Lord high and lifted. And when you're in the presence of God and you're experiencing the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, you'll see him. He's high. He's lifted up. And Isaiah saw that. And then what he did, he saw the power of God. You'll see everything. When you, when you have small faith, the problem is big. But when you have big faith, the problem is small. What's fifty something thousand dollars really worth? I mean, God can do it in many ways. He can grab your money or can touch the heart of the official. Hey, we need you. You're by the water. But when you see the Lord high and lifted up, you see the power, you see the provision of God. God doesn't call you to do something unless He provides the resources to do it. You just go as far as you can. With what you've got, like Joshua crossing the Jordan, the river didn't open up when they were a mile away, a half a mile away, or a yard, or an inch away. The water didn't open up until, help me now, Pastor. They put their feet in the water. Put your feet in the water. Don't stop. And then you will know why God put you on the earth. Don't try to be like everybody else. God did not ordain you to be like everybody else. If you're just like everybody else, you've been pushed into the cookie-cutter mold that the devil wants to make you. What makes you significant and what gives you worth is how you're different than them. The Lord says, come out from among them. And be who I've called you to be. 
be shepherd, says the Lord. And then don't get involved in that unclean stuff anymore. Okay, sometimes you've got to deal with negativity. Watch this. You've probably dealt with this negative negativity. Here's the king who's hiding away in his tent because of Goliath. The king hiding away in his tent says to, to David, you can't do that. You can't. That's what the devil will say. That's what the enemy will say. And the voice that's most effective in stopping you is what you say to yourself. Self-talk. But he says, you can't do this. That's what the, your history will tell you. Oh, look at you. You have no track record. You can't do this. Well, your past doesn't determine your future. Your faith determines your future. Your past determines your experience of your testimony. But we'll get there in a moment. And <clears throat> so he told him all the reasons why he can't. Not enough education. Not enough money. Not enough this. Not enough that. And not enough of the other thing. Always, always an arm's length of reason why not. And here's the, <laughs> but look at the enemy. Look at the problem. Look, look, look at the enemy. I don't see that in the Bible anywhere. I see looking unto Jesus, who is the author, but not just the author, he's the of faith, faith, faith. God doesn't respond to need. He responds to faith. <clears throat> Your pastor has preached this sermon in many ways and the same truths. I just dish it out a little differently. But the same message. Go out and do it anyway. All the naysayers, they said I couldn't do it, and I went out, and I did it anyway. I went to Romania at 60 years of age. But people call me crazy. <laughs> Took all my retirement from you know, Assemblies of God pastor, $23,000. I bought that property for 6000 and I uh, used the rest of the money to fix that burnt-out shell until it was uh, usable for our first time frame. So I had nothing. What would you do, Roy? I had no job. I left for my pastor. What would you do, Roy? <laughs> I took retirement early. I waited till I was 62, and I took retirement early. But why didn't you wait till 65 to get more? Because I didn't have time to wait that long. I was broke. Well, what did you live on? My retirement money. Yeah. Uh, your, your pension check will go far over and beyond that. Okay. Well, then you need a testimony. What you've experienced, your tears, your pain, your suffering, what you have gone through, the good, the bad, the ugly. It's not only the good that is your testimony. It's the difficulties you've gone through. Even your failure is part of your testimony. Because I read someplace in some book, it said something like this. I think it was a book called Romans. I think it had a couple chapters. It was talking about chapter 8. And it had a little verses in there, and it was the verse 28. And I think it goes something like this. And we know, not that we hope or we guess or maybe. Yes, no, this is something that we know. I want to know him. Uh, and it's something that we know. What is it that we know? That God works. How many things? How many things? I can't hear you. Together for what? He's still doing it, ladies and gentlemen. David had testimony. He had to do difficult. He had a testimony. He met the lion. He met the bear. You have a testimony that you've gone through. Brothers and sisters, you're here this morning, and I pray that you'll never be the same again. You'll not be intimidated. You'll not be held down, but you'll rise and you'll do and you'll go what God has put in your heart advisedly, correctly. But do it. Uh, cut the excuses because 
You'll never lose if you don't surrender. Okay, here's this chunky man. I identify with chunky men. Yeah. Yeah, not everybody can have a real man's anatomy, but uh, <laughs> they, uh, they named him after the church on the hill, Winston. And there he was, and uh, he's the prime minister of England, and the Nazis were bombing the stuffing out of his country. London was burning with buzz bombs. And what did he do? He got on the radio, and this is what he said. He said, we'll fight him in France, we'll fight him in the landing grounds, we'll fight him in the sea. That's not maybe what it says up there, but just listen to the Henry with a faint heart. You know, we'll fight him not with less and less confidence, but with growing confidence. Like Abraham, who against hope, he still had the audacity to believe in hope. You, in spite of all that, believe in hope. Keep going. We'll fight him wherever we need to. We'll fight him in the air. We'll fight him in the beaches. We'll fight him on the ocean. We'll fight, we'll fight, we'll fight. You, fight, fight, fight. Don't give up. And this is what he said here. Wait a time. Help me. What does that say? I can't hear you. I don't care. I don't hear you. to this as much as I am here speaking to you behind this august pulpit. It's an honor for me to have you. Galatians says something like this. But be not weary in well-doing. In other words, you're doing well. And the admonition is be not weary because there's coming a due season. Your bill has is coming due. Your house payment, your car payment, uh, your electric bill, it's coming due. But God has a due time too. And he's the one who's going to pay it. Because you've been investing, you've been paying, and now there's coming a due time. Don't give up. Uh, Hang in there, baby. And keep doing what God has called you to do. Because there's coming a due time, but only the provision is if you thank him on it. Thank him. Okay? And I use the next uh, illustration. As you know, hey, you couch potato, get off the couch. Leave that remote control <laughs> someplace. And, and uh, you have a ministry. You have a ministry. Folks, just let me please make a little sidebar here. Credentials on the wall does not put you in the ministry. A salary doesn't, well, I'm, I'm going to go into ministry when I get a salary. No, salary doesn't put you in the ministry. A name tag doesn't put you in the ministry. In fact, a position doesn't put you in the ministry. The only thing that puts you in the ministry is doing ministry. If it looks like a duck, waddles like a duck, it's a, it's a duck. If you're doing the ministry, you're a minister. And nobody can take that away from you. Just get up and do it. They probably have a ministry here for you. I heard there was a ministry waiting for somebody with children and kids and Royal Rangers and so on like that. That's a ministry. As a twig is bent, so grows the tree. Get those kids. Honor those. You put your best teachers with the kids. Most people who today confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior did so before they were 24 years of age. Some of our great American heroes went through difficult times, went through great warfare, but we honor them today by putting them on the dollar bill. (coughs) Okay, Dave, help me. My remote is getting a little weak here. Let's see. Is it still shining? Okay, here it is. Okay, back one. Back one. There you are. Okay. You remember Rocky. You know, and he's fighting uh, against, uh, what's the name of that theater? 
Apollo, Apollo, you know, and I, I mean, Apollo's big, he's powerful, he's well-trained, he's built, and, you know, he's knocking the stuffing out of Rocky and uh, beat him uh, against the ropes, bouncing off the ropes. You, maybe you saw the movie, but I saw the movie, but I'm evangelistically speaking now. And they beat him until he's down on the ground, and you can see the manager in the corner, and he's saying, stay down. He's too big. He's too strong. You've endured too much beating, okay? Your mouth, your nose is bleeding. You've got a cut lip. Stay down. Play, play. One, two, three, four. Rocky, stay down. Play dead. Five, six. He's getting up. Watch him. He's getting up. Look, he's getting up. Stay down. Stay down. He's getting up. Ten, seven. He's up. He's up. He got up again. When you get up again, then you too can change. There's one whom you love. They beat him to a pulp. They nailed him to a cross. He hung there and whimpered out until he said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Then they put him in a cold, dank hay, wrapped him, spiced him up, and wrapped him like a mummy. And on the third day, in spite of everything, he got up again. He got up again. Suggestion. Get up again. Brothers and sisters, get up again. Don't stay down. Rocky got up again. Jesus got up again. Do thou likewise. <laughs> Get up again. This is why we do what we do. We're not here to play games as a church. We're here for a purpose because we, we have a destiny and we need training. We need teaching. We need some things because we have one who died and who rose again from the dead and he's with us here this morning. Do you sense him? Do you feel him speaking to you? Have you tuned me out and you're listening to another voice, the voice of the Spirit of God ministering to you, lifting you, encouraging you, bringing the dream back to your remembrance? Get up again. Sometimes it seems like you can't go ahead. There's a closed door. All closed doors are not necessarily from the devil. You know, sometimes God says, don't go there. That relationship died, leave it alone. Maybe that wasn't the right relationship. Sometimes it's appropriate to time to say goodbye. Closed door is okay, but we have this promise that he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Get out of the boat. Get out of the boat. We think of Peter sinking, but what about those guys watching him, those timid souls sitting in the boat, watching a man of faith get out of the boat there? Uh, you never hear about those guys who were sitting in the boat. You only hear about the guy who got out of the boat, and who became the great leader of the church in Jerusalem, the guy who got out of the boat, get out of the boat, he will be there if you sink, <laughs> but you'll never forget you got out of the boat, uh, and so in closing here, you know, we have problems, sometimes we feel like we're getting beaten up, we've been rejected. I've been rejected. How about you? Have you ever felt the, the power of rejection, the sinking feeling of rejection? I've been there. I've done that. You feel broke, <laughs> empty pockets, and uh, a mind that's a weak and a back that's strong. Or you sense the, 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 the crushing sense of loneliness, and you want to just stick up your hand <laughs> and say, I give up. Well, the principle is never surrender. <laughs> never surrender because we have the power. We're Pentecostal people. We believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
of the new birth through uh, the vicarious death of our Lord Jesus Christ and the infilling of the Holy Spirit, what for? To stay there? No. To get up and do what God has called us to do. So it doesn't matter what other people see in you. It matters what you see in you. Okay? And you may think you're the pussycat, but you look in the mirror of God's word, you'll see a mighty man and woman of valor. Amen? Joshua was here. He fit the battle of Jericho, and the wall came tumbling down. He was here. He's dead. He's gone. He did what he had to do. David was here. He hit the giant. Giant's gone. David's gone. Gideon did a mighty work. God called him who did, never did anything brave in his life, a mighty man of valor. Oh, some people have gone into your destiny yet doesn't mean it ain't coming. John the Baptist, he didn't fit in, didn't eat the same food, didn't dress the same way, but he was here. He did a great work. He introduced the world to the Son of God. He must increase. I must decrease. He was here. He did what he could. He's gone. The great apostle Paul, he wrote his greatest epistles while he was in jail. What do you do when you're in a hard place? They're all dead. They're all gone. They were here. But brothers and sisters, I just announced to you, now it's your turn. Now it's your time. Now you're here. Time to rise up. Time to do what God has called you to do. How? By the things we know to do. Pray, believe, submit to the our proper authorities, and uh, go and do what you can, and you too become a champion. So I just want to ask the question in closing. Are there any champions in the house this morning? Do I see any? Cha <laughs> Do I see any champions? Do I hear any champions? Oh yes. You know, I I see something in you. I see something in you. I don't know what it is. Oh yes, I see a champion. I see a champion. 